And now let me introduce Dr. Christy Funk. Dr. Christy Funk is one of my favorite doctors in the entire universe. She is a board certified breast cancer surgeon. She works at the Pink Lotus Breast Center in Los Angeles, and she has done more than anybody to get the word out about what women can do to empower themselves to reduce the risk of this disease and to survive this disease. Uh, Dr. Funk. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I guess that pretty much covers uh, an international Zoom meeting greeting no matter where you are, it could be tomorrow. Um, so as Dr. Barnard said, I co-founded the Pink Lotus Breast Center with my husband, which is a fully comprehensive breast center that marries state-of-the-art imaging and surgery with um, complementary medicine, including like Chinese medicine and nutrition. But what I really want you to know about as a powerful resource for you to share with your own patients or clients is Power Up. So Pink Lotus Power Up is a community that empowers every member and it is entirely free. There are a number of things that women can seek out if they're interested. So we've got a lot of blogs and breaking news if they want information um, about the latest and greatest. We have this whole cancer kicking area that's more educational. It has podcasts and the recipe section and my annual summit. This, um, Breast groups features like a Facebook kind of thing. We can get in and connect with others and break out in chats and like, I hate aromatase, anybody else hear me? And start um, creating friendships that way. Pink events, you can list your own like 10K that's coming up. Breast list is kind of like Craigslist where you can buy, sell, trade, used wigs or scarves or bras, et cetera. And then Crowd Cause is a cheaper version of GoFundMe if you're needing to help raise resources. And my favorite thing that I really want you to understand is Breast Buddies. So Breast Buddies, pairs newly diagnosed women stage for stage and age for age with those who have been there done that so basically you can put in like 52 years old chemotherapy mastectomy and brrr, like match.com will come some people that you can look at and be like oh she has a 10 year old too i want to talk to her and the reason why this is so critically important to me is evidenced by this study lace over 2200 early stage women with breast cancer were followed for an average of 10.8 years. Those reporting low levels of social support from friends and family and lack of religious or social participation were 58% more likely to have died during the study period than those with high levels of support. And a key factor there is that this is early stage cancer. That's how much community and love matters. So many women, you know, they don't have a BFF or they don't like their family very much, but everybody can have a breast buddy. All right, so on to some facts. We've got a poll. Women will most likely die from A, heart disease, B, lung cancer, C, breast cancer, or D, colon cancer. Haha, <laughs> I knew you all get it right. I just wanted to start off the talk with a bang and make everybody happy that they got it right. Um, yes, of course, it is heart disease. You are 26 times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease this year and seven times more likely to die from a heart attack than you are to get or die from breast cancer. But looking at the prevalence of cancers, behind skin, breast is far and away the most common, accounting for 30% of all cancers that will be diagnosed in women this year. So let's get our minds around some stats to understand how pervasive the problem is. There are 3.8 million breast cancer survivors in the US who either had or currently have breast cancer. But sadly, well over 1.5 million have died since 1970, so there's work to do. Men, you do get breast cancer, you have breasts, and about 2,600 will be diagnosed this year, 500 will die. The death rate from breast cancer, though, has been going down steadily, about 2.2% per year since 1998. That's largely owing to earlier detection and better treatment options. So much so that the five-year survival rate for a node-negative cancer is 99%, which is just phenomenal. 95% of all breast cancer happens in women who are over 40. And this is something to note because I hear all the time people are like, there's such an epidemic of breast cancer. It's like rampant and getting younger and younger, isn't it? And I'm like, well, no, I know three facts. So first of all, the converse is true that only 5% of breast cancer occurs in women under 40 as of last year. That's been true for decades. 
And secondly, the median age, so half of the people at or above this age and half below, the median age for breast cancer is 62 years old. And then finally, yes, the incidence has had a slow rise since 2004. Since 2012, it's 0.3% increase in breast cancer incidence per year. So even a computer for a mind wouldn't probably notice that increase. But what is happening that's dramatically different than ever before is simply it is no longer taboo to talk about breasts and cancer. Social media and news shows discuss it liberally. And so now you're readily hearing about your friend's friend who had a 24-year-old friend who got breast cancer. And so it's a story you never would have known about 15 years ago and cancer is seeming more common. I want to talk about a few risk factors, the big ones, that you cannot change. Mostly, so, you know, knowledge is power, but also to incentivize you to really hang on to the rest of the talk when we're focusing on things that you can change that are completely under your control. So the first thing you can't do anything about is being a woman. And why would you want to do anything about that? Women rock. Um, but one in eight women gets breast cancer versus 1.3 in 100,000 men. So being female is your biggest risk factor, followed then by age. So one thing about age that I love to dispel is this idea that, okay, one in eight women gets breast cancer, that's 12.8% turns out of all women will get breast cancer. But it's not 12.8% every morning when you wake up, that's your risk. We'd all have it by Christmas. That's a percent that's pulled out across your lifetime. So if you take a look here, you'll see that if your current age is 20, the chances of getting breast cancer by age 30 in the next decade one in 1,479. Between 30 and 40, one in 209. Between 40 and 50, one in 65. Between 50 and 60, one in 42. Between 60 and 70, one in 28. Between 70 and 80, one in 25. Let's highlight that. That is your highest risk decade in which to get breast cancer. Hence my small beef with being told to stop mammograms at age 74. And then between 80 and 91 and 33, and go on to be a centenarian. Um, so that helps you put it into perspective relative to what age you are now. Your risk, when you add in all, add up all the one ins, then totals one in eight for a lifetime. Okay, so now let's talk family history. Why are doctors always so interested in family history? It's because if there is a strong family history, there is a possibility of carrying an inherited gene mutation like BRCA or PALB2 or CHECK2. So let's see who knows this one. What percentage of breast cancer can be attributed to an inherited genetic mutation such as BRCA? A, 5 to 10 percent, B, 30 to 40 percent, C, 60 to 70 percent, and D, 80 to 90 percent. Okay, and the correct answer is 5 to 10%. So only 5 to 10% of all breast cancer can be attributed to something that you inherit from your mom or your dad's side, which is very key to remember that you are half your dad's DNA. Even doctors somehow just think the maternal line is important, I guess, because they're thinking breasts and you don't get your breasts from your mom. You're a genetic patchwork of both mom and dad. So first, second, and third degree relatives on both sides all matter when you're trying to figure out if there's a possibility of a genetic mutation. And while it only accounts for, it turns out, a very small percentage of breast cancers, it's a powerful issue when you do carry a gene mutation. What is BRCA, for example? It's a tumor suppressor gene. So that means we all have BRCA genes. They're supposed to work. And when they do, they're surveying the land and they identify some abnormal DNA and either fix it or throw it out. But when your BRCA is broken and the DNA goes awry, your body's a little bit like, hmm, good luck with that. And the luck is usually uh, not very high. <laughs> In other words, if you have a BRCA1 mutation, for example, your lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is up to 87% and your ovarian cancer risk is up to 44%. So do your patients or clients possibly have a gene mutation? What about you? Here is the list of red flags that basically insurance covers when it comes to um, 
paying for the genetic testing. But here's another thing. Now you can get a panel of 89 different genes, and if insurance doesn't cover it, it's still $249. So fairly affordable for some priceless information if you're worried. But here's the short list. Again, mom and dad side for second and third degree relatives. If you have two relatives on the same side with breast cancer prior to age 50 or ovarian cancer at any age, you should test. If you're Ashkenazi Jewish, I call it the Jewish special. You only need one breast cancer prior to age 50 or ovarian cancer at any age. If you yourself have had breast cancer prior to menopause, a triple negative aggressive subtype prior to age 60, or two primary breast cancers, so not cancer in a recurrence, but actually two totally different ones. If any men in the family tree have ever had breast cancer, if there's a known gene mutation, and then if there's pancreatic in anyone plus ovarian or breast, not the same person, but just same side. Finally, a whole lot of cancer going on, particularly three or more breast, ovarian, pancreas, prostate, colorectal, gastric, uterine, or melanoma. Those are all reasons to consider genetic testing. So having said that about how infrequent but important gene mutations are, here's an interesting stat. 87% of women with breast cancer don't have a single first degree relative with breast cancer. Wow, okay, so if we can't blame our parents, who can you blame? We can get some insight looking at immigration patterns. So if you look at Japanese immigrants uh, into Los Angeles and Hawaii after 1982 and Chinese to Hawaii after 1992, you will find they develop breast cancer at rates that are over 100% higher than their Japanese and Chinese relatives still in the homeland. But even when they stay in Asia, look at this. Between 1990 and 2000, the death rate from breast cancer in the U.S. decreased 15%, but it skyrocketed in Japan by 55%. What happened? Well, beginning in the 1970s, you've got Japan and Singapore and urban areas of China increasing in affluence. And they sparked westernized changes to their diets and to their lifestyle. For example, instead of laboring at home all day, getting married young, having babies, breastfeeding them, making homemade nutritious meal meals, and chasing after those kids, women entered the workforce in droves. Now they're living stressed out, sedentary lives, sending emails off stat, and um, you know, grabbing takeout on the way home to plop it on the table before they plop themselves on the couch with a glass of wine and watching a Netflix show, right? So Asians started to chase our culture, and as a result, they caught our cancer. So let's talk about ch these changes that you can implement in your lives, in your patients' lives. And, and I want you to know something, everything you're gonna learn in this conference, it's not just about breasts, because uh, food and lifestyle changes aren't particular to the breast cells, right? So this is gonna yield everything you ever wanted, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, fewer heart attacks, a leaner body, less diabetes, painless joints, more energy, better sleep, a happier mood, a better sex life, a sharper mind, smoother skin, regular bowel movements, which is exciting for many people, uh, cleaner lungs, less cancer in every organ of your body, just basically a healthier planet and a longer life. So you may not just radically reduce, but completely prevent many of the illnesses that ultimately lead to chronic and life-threatening disease. Of all of the controllable risk factors for breast cancer, in my heavily researched opinion, the most important one is something that you do probably three to six times a day, and that is eat. The key to using food to protect yourself from breast cancer is to understand this. Every time you chew and swallow, whatever was on the end of that fork, for better or for worse, has the power to alter these following factors inside of you, estrogen levels, growth factors, particularly insulin-like growth factor one, new blood vessel formation, right? Angiogenesis, those sinister little cancers need to create new blood flow that comes specifically to them to bring the nutrients they need to proliferate and grow and multiply and divide and guess what? Exit strategy, straight out those same blood vessels, they metastasize lung, liver, brain, bone. Inflammation abounds, immune system function, goes downhill, and free radical formation ultimately forms in this battle of oxidative stress inside your body all day long. 
food affects each one of those factors, which then become what we call a cell microenvironment. So for a tumor cell, that little micro is like a bathtub that it's sitting in with all of these factors that literally bathe and support and fuel that cancer. Oh, or seeks it out and destroys it. You choose, you decide. Every single time you lift fork to mouth, you chew and you swallow and you will enter into something called oxidative stress. Okay, I have, a, I have a story to tell you because I love this. This is to me so powerful and it will change your eating forever. They took 50 men and women and they gave them a standard American diet for breakfast. So you're talking like pancakes and bacon or steak and eggs. And they measured LDL, oxidized cholesterol hourly as a measure of oxidative stress. So up, up, up it went. Lunch, hamburger and fries. Up, 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 dinner. <sighs> These people are going to bed every single night with fewer antioxidants than when they woke up, right? So there's only so much hammering in this oxidative world that your body can handle until finally it gives up and the stress creates enough plaque to give you that heart attack. The stress creates enough uh, mutagenic opportunity for a cancer cell to finally form a detectable mass. Okay, the study gets interesting. Next day, same people, same sad meal, one change a cup of strawberries. Huh. Cholesterol up, up, down, down, baseline by noon. Hamburger and fries, one cup of strawberries. Up, up, down, down, baseline. What the power of antioxidants in just a mere cup of strawberries was able to basically negate all of the oxidative stress that that terrible meal had given. But, but what would happen if the meal to begin with had been like, steel cut oats and blueberries with a little flaxseed and cinnamon on it. What if? Well, eating is catabolic, so there'd be a little oxidative stress, but the battle will be over in like an hour. And then what happens next? So you just chewed and swallowed, but you unleashed weapons inside your body with that meal. It's like plant warfare, right? You've got these phytochemicals, these plant-based chemicals that are real like the curcumin and turmeric, the epigallocatechin gallate and, and uh, green tea, omega-3 fatty acids and lignans and flax seeds. These components, these chemicals get into your bloodstream, coursing through your veins, saturating cells and promoting health, reversing illness, preventing problems. They do the opposite. They do the healthful things on the initial list. So plant-based foods are naturally anti-estrogen, anti-inflammatory, anti-free radicals, anti-IGF-1, literally anti-angiogenic. Speaking of IGF-1, this has one mission in life, right? It's to grow. Everybody grow, grow, grow. It just screams it at everything. And that's awesome if you're a kid and need to grow taller, but your hands only get so big. And then, you know, what's IGF-1 doing all day? Turns out, you um, turn over 50 billion cells a day. So thanks, IGF-1, for helping us out there. Post-exercise muscles need repairing. Your brain cells need protecting. But what if you have an excess of IGF-1 such that it's still screaming, grow, 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 and the daily deeds are over? Well, grow things well. Growing atherosclerotic plaque, growing cancer cells, growing you fat. And the only thing, the only trigger that will elevate IGF-1 to these supernormal levels beyond what you need for the daily activities is to consume animal fat and animal protein. That will elevate your IGF-1. It turns out that your brain tells your liver to produce uh, IGF-1 predominantly in response to eating animal protein. So if that's true, let's look at what this study showed. Over 6,000 adults over age 50 were followed for 18 years and those that were ages 50 to 65, higher animal protein levels led to an astounding 430% increase in cancer death and a 7,300% increase in diabetes. And IGF-1 emerged as an important moderator uh, of the association between protein consumption and mortality, because wherever protein went, IGF-1 was sure to follow, just like Mary and her little lamb. So notably, no such elevations in IGF-1 happened with proteins derived from plants, just animals. 
However, I do know, for example, if you consume an extraordinary amount of soy protein, you will elevate your IGF-1. And by extraordinary, I would the studies would show seven servings daily, like sustained. So there is there is a limit to how much plant protein you want to be consuming um, in order to keep your IGF-1 levels normal. This is how important IGF-1 is in the causation of cancer and of diabetes. Have you ever heard of Laron syndrome? These are people in Ecuador and um, as they can't, they can't synthesize, they can't, they don't have receptors for IGF-1, okay? So they are all very short because they don't grow. But here's the phenomenal thing. No one in the history of the world with Laron syndrome has ever had breast cancer. In fact, no one has ever had any cancer except one woman once had an ovarian cancer. That is it, none, no cancer. Astounding and even more astounding still, especially when you look at their body habitus, nobody with Laron syndrome in the history of the world has had type 2 diabetes. That is how much the bad things that can happen in your body love IGF-1. Do not fuel that micro environment with IGF-1. Okay. Oh, this is one of my favorite studies. I might happen to say that like 20 times whenever I talk about any study because anything I want to talk about is going to blow your mind, I hope. But this is one of my favorites, and I'll tell you why. When a woman comes to me, and she's like 74 years old, and she's um, a little overweight and knows that she doesn't eat all that great, and she's got breast cancer, and I start getting excited because we got some changing to do. It's like this cancer did not come here to kill you. It came here to change you. And I have so many ideas about how you can change. And she says, oh, Doc, it's too late for me. Then I bring up this study because it is never too late for you, sister. So this amazing study took 50 uh, obese women and measured their IGF-1 levels, measured their IGF-1 binding protein, which is like the body snatcher that retires excess IGF-1, and then took their blood and dripped it on a Petri dish blanketed with human breast cancer cells. Yeah, a few cells died because if you're alive, your immune system's doing a little something, something right? So then these women go away and they follow the Pritikin plan, a low fat, high fiber, whole food plant-based diet with daily exercise classes that were only like 30 minutes. And they go away for a whopping 12 days, 12 days. And they come back, draw the levels, IGF-1 has plummeted, binding protein has skyrocketed, and wait for it, they take their blood, sprinkle it on a fresh Petri dish of human breast cancer cells, and the majority of cancer cells annihilated on the spot. These women turned their blood into a cancer kicking machine in less than two weeks. It is never too late for you. I get a lot of this though, doc, I lost 30 pounds on keto, I've never felt better, so what about that, or paleo, or Atkins, or South Beach, because I love myself a cheeseburger. Well, okay, despite the fact that man in the paleo period uh, did not eat that way, and I'm not even going to get into the fact that eating meat and dairy leads to horrific animal cruelty and water pollution and water scarcity and pesticide and antibiotic overuse and the emergence of superbugs. I'm not going to talk about climate change or biodiversity loss or planet destruction, exacerbation of world hunger, catastrophic natural disasters, oh, such as like heat waves, floods, wildfires, melting ice caps, and irony upon irony, the end of life on this planet, uh, despite the fact that animal agriculture is basically the number one contributor to all of those stated atrocities, um, I'm not going to say that any of that is a reason for you to avoid low-carb, meat-centric diets like keto. I'm just going to give you one reason. Your LAD, your left anterior descending artery. <laughs> AKA your own life. So Dr. Dean Ornish's lifestyle heart trial published in 1990. Um, and I say that on purpose, 1990. You know why? Because I went to medical school in 1992. Do you know when I heard about this remarkable study? 2017, when I was doing a deep dive into nutritional science to write the research behind my book, Breast the Owner's Manual, I went into the nutritional world for the first time in my life, because I'm sure you all know you don't get any of this in medical school to really just prove that the way I ate was correct, which was largely um, Mediterranean diet, tons of fruits and vegetables, but lean meats all the time, chicken, turkey, fish, I love myself some cheese, and um, 
I had so much sushi, I was probably radioactive and didn't care. Didn't want to check the mercury levels. I don't want to know. Anyway, um, when I did that said deep dive, I uncovered this study and many of the others, everything I'm talking to you about, and it led to a complete and total transformation of my life, my kids, my husband, um, and I'll share that with you later. But the um, point at which I came across Dr. Ornish's study was then. And I'm like, what, what was this published in Greenleaf Magazine? No, it's the Lancet, like the most cherished, reputable medical journal in the world. So how come I never heard about it? I don't know, but if you haven't, you're welcome. Listen to this. So this is a um, randomized controlled trial perspective that wanted to determine whether comprehensive lifestyle changes could affect coronary atherosclerosis. So he did angiogram before and afters. So this was a year long study. And in, in the um, experimental group, they were assigned to a low fat vegetarian diet, stop smoking, stress management, some moderate exercise, that's it. And then the other half randomized to usual care as the control group. Aha, okay, so before you go, let's take a picture. And as you can see here, we've got some blood like barely getting by to that cardiac muscle. And then they come back a year later and take another picture. Astounding. 82% of the people in the experimental group had dramatic improvement. Not everybody was like shoo, arteries wide open, but this guy was. Improvement in 82%, no improvement in the control group. Those that came back and were still alive. It's not just Dr. Ornish's work. On the other side of the country, at the very same time, of course, Dr. Esselstyn has astounding results from his 20-year-plus nutrition study, uh, the longest study of its kind ever conducted, by the way, which signs, seals, and delivers the plant-based prescription uh, with angiographic proof as well. So, you know, to date, there is only one diet in the history of the world that can slow, stop, and reverse the number one killer of everybody, heart disease, but also slow, stomp, and even reverse our other killers, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, obesity, and cancer. So when bacon and butterproof, bulletproof, sorry, coffee can do all of that, then the keto lovers will have my attention. It doesn't just affect your heart, as I said, and it will affect your breast too. This big study followed 190 plus thousand people, postmenopausal women over nine years, and they found a 25% increase in breast cancer in red and processed meat consumers. This, um, this was interesting to me because it springboarded my research to find out about the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And in July 2015, they met in Lyon, France. There were 22 researchers from 10 different countries who poured over 800 epidemiologic studies to answer two questions. Does red meat cause cancer? And does processed meat cause cancer? And within a resounding, oh heck yeah, for sure, class one, along with plutonium and asbestos and tobacco, all processed meat causes cancer. Red meat, probably. I mean, we know it causes colorectal. Hey, um, what, what's processed meat? I literally, I Googled it just to make sure, make sure I had it all right. I mean, I knew it was bacon and sausage, but what else is on that list? You know, I never really thought about it. I didn't think about deli slices, organic chicken breast or turkey breast slices being processed meat and totally carcinogenic. And the bummer is that very day I read that study, um, when I was writing my book, I would take Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'd write for like 18 hours a day, no lie. And I didn't parent for the whole year. Don't even know what happened for second grade. So I have these three sons, they're triplets, and they're um, just seven at the time. And that day, I kid you not, I'm going to be a good mom, I'm going to make them lunch, because I've been like absent for months. So I did this. Being a product of the 80s, I would avoid uh, things like bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes. I thought those foods would just make me fat. So being a good mom, I was passing on my carb phobia to my kids. So they didn't get any bread with their sandwich, but I did take organic turkey breast slices, roll them around, so embarrassed, a mozzarella stick, and then put all of that wrapped in lettuce. 
true story. They come home. I go running down, just grateful they're not already dead. I mean, I'm thinking I could just roll up cigarettes instead. I go flying down. I'm like, boys, 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 come here, come here, come here. We run over to the refrigerator, and with great drama and flair, I fling open the refrigerator doors and say, boys, we're going vegan. And they're like, yeah, what is vegan? And that was it. We filled grocery bags, four of them, to the brim with the big salmon filet I just bought and my cheese drawer, my five-year-age Gouda and Manchego and all that, just into the bags, out the door, done and done. And uh, that was three and a half years ago. We haven't looked back, all five of us. Okay, which grilled steak is the least carcinogenic? Well, it's rare. Why? Because certain mutagens, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines to be exact, form on the surface of well done and what most people would consider deliciously uh, grilled, roasted, pan fried or barbecued meats. But these HCAs, they form within minutes at high temperatures on the grill. But what you might not know is they also form when you cook that organic, boneless, skinless chicken breast in the oven for 15 or 30 minutes um, at low temperatures. So they form on the surface because there's a certain chemical reaction between the heat and the creatinine in muscle tissue. So fried and grilled veggie burgers, for example, or the char on broccoli, I mean, I'm sure the char isn't exactly like a health food, but it doesn't contain these mutagens. So you should have your food rare and risk life-threatening uh, bloody diarrhea from bacterial overgrowth instead of cooked. 50% um, higher breast cancer rates for those who consume hamburgers regularly, 64% higher for bacon eaters, 121% higher for beefsteak lovers, and for women who've just got to have it all, 362 increase for those who eat all three. So wait a minute, this is a meat to meat eaters comparison. What would you find if you compared meat lovers to vegans? Okay, so this study followed 70,000 people for four years, and there are about 3,000 cancers, and they categorized eating as meat, vegan, pescatarian, lacto-ovo, or semi-vegetarian. And check it out! The vegans were the only subgroup to show a statistically significant 34% drop in breast and gynecologic cancers relative to meat eaters. So the addition of fish or milk or eggs to the diet largely negated the anti-cancer properties of the otherwise vegetarian food. So when people say to me, like, what about, like, what about wild caught? What about organic? What about grass fed? I mean, I don't care how many happy acres that cow had before it was beheaded. There are certain things that are always going to be true. So the only thing you're avoiding with organic and grass fed and wild caught are these contaminants and additives to it, right? The injected xeranol in the beef, for example. But the cellular response to the chewing and swallowing, right? The estrogen, the IGF-1, et cetera, that will always be the same no matter how happy the cow was. And you're also going to naturally consume what's in the meat and milk that you don't really want, like cholesterol and saturated fat. Then you get the carcinogens from cooking that we talked about. And then what's not in the meat or milk. So you're not getting a ton of vitamins. You're not getting any fiber, Zippo, in any meat or milk product. And you're uh, not getting a single phytonutrient. So that's a good response when people are asking you, but what, but what, compared to what, compared to what? The lentil burger is always going to win no matter how pure the meat patty was. Where do you get your protein? There's a whole list there for you to reference. I want to take one more poll. Women with breast cancer, because I did say soy was on the list of proteins, they should avoid soy. True or false? Okay. Ooh, all right, little, little divide there, 80-20, 80% thinking it's false, and it is false. So what's the real deal here on soy? I want you to understand this. You've got two receptors for estrogen in your body, alpha and beta, and the cancer-fueling estrogen from your ovary, your adrenal gland, is going to um, hit alpha, whereas soy with 1,800% with more um, interest is going to hit the beta receptor and beta just fascinating things. It shuts alpha down so it acts like tamoxifen in your body and it goes out into your fat cells and shuts off the aromatase enzyme which is that enzyme converting your adrenal gland steroids like androstenedione dione and testosterone into estrogen. So it's lowering your estrogen and blocking the cancer receptor. And indeed 
people who consume soy have less breast cancer. 59%, 58, 43 for high versus low soy consumers, even in the dreaded BRCA gene mutation uh, situation. You also have less breast cancer recurrence and death once you have an estrogen-driven breast cancer. You do not need to spit that miso out of your mouth, which I sadly told people for 18 years before I did the research for the book and found out that I was embarrassingly wrong. So uh, if you have an estrogen-driven cancer, consuming soy is going to decrease recurrence to the tune that tamoxifen decreases it. Isn't that interesting? 60% drop in recurrence, 51 in mortality rates. And on and on it goes, decreased death, decreased recurrence. This is the food that you should be eating. Here are some breast superfoods in a tidy list that you can reference. Fiber is just so mighty that I wanted to give it its own slide and attention. And I wanted to highlight one thing, and that is that of all the controllable risk factors on this list, being overweight is far and away the one that has no controversy about it giving women a 50 to 250 percent increase in breast cancer occurrence and then twice the recurrence and more breast cancer related deaths than non-obese women but the good news here is if you lose that weight you lose the risk even if you just briskly walk for 11 minutes a day you drop breast cancer by 18 percent you put some pep in that step 30 to 40 percent lower alcohol increases estrogen forms carcinogens like acetaldehyde impairs your immune function is not a good thing so I invite you to join PCRM and myself for our Let's Be Breast Cancer campaign. This emphasizes these four healthy foods and behaviors, whole food plant-based eating, daily exercise, minimizing or eliminating alcohol, and maintaining an ideal body weight as your best defense against this disease. And if you want to learn more about my um, thoughts, and I wrote it all down for you in this little neat book, The Owner's Manual. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Funk. So we have some audience questions for you. Get ready. That was an amazing presentation. So I think everyone is, is pretty fired up. Okay. So what this is actually more on the medical than the nutrition side, but excited to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on hormone replacement therapy for women with no hysterectomy or family history of breast cancer? So this is a lower risk woman to get breast cancer, but as you saw from my presentation, low risk doesn't mean much, right? No family history uh, is the story of 80% of people with breast cancer. So it, HRT becomes a delicate uh, individualized conversation, but here's the deal. In the Women's Health Initiative, which published in 2002, July 2002, they um, stopped that study prematurely at 5.2 years because there was a clear 26% increase in breast cancers in those women taking Prempro, so estrogen plus progesterone versus the placebo. They also in that study saw more heart attacks and dementia and strokes. So it was halted early and they said, yep, for sure, especially because you said with a uterus, that means you're gonna need the progesterone component. That is, uh, cancer causing situation, but when you're individualizing it, basically it comes down to this. If you put a thousand of you on HRT, seven will get a breast cancer that otherwise would not have happened. That is because of the HRT. So I always encourage women to answer the question, why? Why do you want to be on it? Are you chasing the fountain of youth or do you have debilitating hot flashes or is your sex drive and libido through, you know, plummeting and you hot flashing your way to a divorce, like what is the issue? Because maybe we have alternatives. We've got acupuncture, for example, that works quite well for hot flashes. Menopause Miracle is an herbal supplement that works well. So I encourage you to investigate alternatives before you leap to something that ultimately uh, increases cancer. Oh, by the way, I'll say in 2002, when that study came out, literally 33 million prescriptions for HRT over the next year disappeared. And the following year, an unprecedented 7% drop in breast cancer, postmenopausal estrogen driven breast cancer, cancer disappeared from our uh, country in one year, just from stopping the HRT. That is a cancel on cancer. Wow. That's a, uh, yeah. Okay. Good to know. Well, this actually is a nice segue into the next question we had, which is in addition to lifestyle, do you recommend any supplements or complementary or alternative modalities, especially for women who've already been diagnosed? Uh, you know, I do have a few supplements, but they're basically symptom driven for the cancer patients. So for example, um, I was mentioning Menopause Miracle, that has three randomized controlled trials behind it against placebo and 
did not increase estrogen levels. And there's another separate study that looked at liver metabolism to make sure it didn't interfere with cytochrome P450 to therefore interfere with the metabolism of your anti-cancer drugs like tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitors. So that is a, but when you say supplements like a daily multivitamin or such, they, if you're eating whole food plant-based and I emphasize whole food and not, you know, hyper-processed impossible burgers, you really don't need, you're going to be balanced in your supplements, but there are a few to always consider if you're totally vegan. Of course, you want to be taking a B12. You probably want to be taking a DHA EPA supplement. And you, as a breast cancer thriver, want to be sure that your vitamin D levels are between 40 and 80 nanograms per deciliter. So get them checked. If your doc isn't doing that, it's imperative because I, many of my breast cancer patients start off on 50,000 units of D a week and then end up like maintaining it like 5,000 a day. So that's something you definitely want to look at. But then, like I said, we've got, if you, um, there's things like for joint pain that are good supplements, joint pieces one. So there are supplements, but they're symptom driven in my opinion. And then there's just like the big vegan three um, and then some other things like calcium and iron that you want to look at. Okay, thanks. Oh, um, oh, oh go. I know, I know, I can talk forever. But I, the other thing about it's not supplements, but it's actually the, they're they're study proven very anti-estrogenic in your body. So I already went through soy very quickly, but soy and flax seeds, the lignans and flax seeds are the most um, concentrated of any other food source on earth. And that's a powerful anti-estrogen in your body. As are citrus, button mushrooms, and the whole cruciferous family. Um, so, you know, your broccoli and broccoli sprouts and fiber, wherever you can get that stuff. Fiber just binds estrogen and makes you poop out the excess. So there are ways to eat your supplements from the whole foods that are directly anti-estrogenic. Final, final answer? That's it. I'm done. Okay. With that one. <laughs> um, that's actually fun because you kind of answered the next question, but I'll go ahead and, and tack it in there anyway. This is coming from an audience member. <laughs> this one's me. So <laughs> if you, <laughs> what are three foods? And I think you just answered at least one of them. What are three foods that you personally will not skip every day or any day when it comes to breast health? Every single day I get three servings of soy. Every single day I get a half cup of raw broccoli. And every single day I get two tablespoons of ground flax seeds, smoothies, salads, oatmeal. The smoothies are like a coverall. You can put any amount of icky things. Not, none of those three is icky, but um, with, with like a soy milk base and a bunch of berries and two fistfuls of green, then you can add anything else in there that you don't necessarily like the taste of and it'll go down like a delicious dessert. Love that. And yeah, you can put really anything in a smoothie. Love it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> delicious enough. Right. All right. Next one. Can you please comment on the impact of a whole food plant-based diet on postmenopausal symptoms? So it's a little outside of, of breast health, but most particularly hot flashes. Have you seen any changes in your patients who have gone whole food plant-based with those symptoms? For sure. So the um, soy actually is the best studied and the mightiest against hot flashes. So those who consume more soy, but I have seen that going plant-based will definitely decrease. And, and Dr. Barnard's book, Your Body in Balance, has a whole chapter on menopause and how plants affect that um, hyperthermic reaction to the <laughs> imbalance of your hormones. So I, I would say that you reference his book for more info on that. All right, fantastic. We were getting more questions on soy. So we know that it's good, but the question is a little more nuanced. Are all forms of soy beneficial for breast health? For example, fermented soy or like a processed soy alternative burger? Yeah, what's, the, great, but, what's the status? Okay, so here's the status. No, not all soy is created equal. And first of all, don't even, no corn and soy for sure, 100%. I won't touch it if it's not non-GMO. And basically, I always have organic, okay, so for corn and soy, because those two crops and wheat are just so laden with glyphosate and, you know, it just dumped on with all that chemical nastiness. So it gets into your bodies. Um, there's studies on that, like it's tested in the urine of kids and such. So um, always non-GMO and organic, number one. Number two, actually the fermented soy. So you're talking there about tamari, miso, uh, natto, Woo! not for the faint of heart, that one, but um, those are your fermented soys. And they actually are even a little bit more powerful in their phytonutrient absorption and bioavailability. So they would be A number one. Next down on your list is going to be minimally processed. So soy milk, again, organic, tofu, um, soybeans, 
and uh, edamame, those are all going to be great to consume. Now you've got your next level, which is the isolated soy protein, which is going to be texturized and it's meant to be added into things like these burgers and meat substitutes. And the problem there is twofold. Number one, it's been so divorced from its original natural form that a lot of the phytonutrient power is kind of an unknown now because what we've studied is the whole food. And once you strip it away and divorce it from like its fibers and other nutrients, that synergistic reaction is no longer possible. Number two, what it's then combined with, because it's kind of gross on its own, as an isolated soy protein, is probably not going to be good for you. A lot things like palm oil are going to go into making like some sort of meat contraption thing, like an impossible burger. So, so no, those are like for birthdays only kind of a food. Okay. Your- so, so when in doubt, keep it whole. Oh, yes. All right. Okay. Sounds great. Well, we are actually just on the minute out of time. So thank you so much, Dr. Funk, for an amazing presentation and some great answers to questions. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, everybody.